We're gonna to start today's show off with a question for you, Eric Long. Yes. The question for you is as follows. When you think of the tools in a wildlife manager's toolbox, the projects that they can complete mm -hmm. on a piece of property, what are the first ones that come to mind? Oh, the tools and the management toolbox. One of the most popular ones, obviously, behind us is a uh, food plot. Everybody food plot. loves food plots, huh? you yeah, know? Yeah. Everyone likes playing farmer. But then you have, you know, timber stand improvement. You have old field type management. You have warm season grasses slash pollinators and then water holes, you know, and pine plantings, soft, hard mass plantings. So yeah. that's basically what's in your management toolbox. But to me, the missing component is what <laughs> might be, and it is, is, it is in my opinion, the most important thing a landowner can do on their property when managing for wildlife, and that is controlling non-native invasive species. Absolutely, hands down. Why I, I'm guilty of it to leave that tool at home. I don't know what it is about it. That, um, it's a lot of work, Cody. <laughs> it is a lot of work. It's a lot it of is. work and dedication. You gotta have the desire to do it. It's not yeah. for the faint of heart, yeah. but I think it's, when we're talking long-term, which that's what wildlife management yep. is about, it's, you've said it, we all say it, never about the now, always about the future. future. Absolutely. So that's what we're gonna talk about today, managing non-native invasive species on your property and why it should be at the top of your to-do list. One thing, when you tackle any type of management um, technique, you know, that's gonna cause a disturbance, whether it's cutting or creating an old field environment, you have to be honest with yourself. It's like, I want to do a two acre opening, you know, create a, um, an old field environment inside of a woods. Let's just pick that for example. It's not a money issue. It's a time issue. Do I have time to do the prep before and or after? Because if you don't, either scale it down or try to come up with some another thing because when you do a cut and if you don't go in there and you have all this like tree of heaven it's Atlantis for example pitch picking one invasive that we have a problem with throughout the country uh, at least in the east it out competes other uh, species that you're trying to promote so if you don't have a really good game plan you know and it like again it goes back to time sometimes either scale it down smaller where you can control it and uh or just really i'll be honest with you i'd rather you not do it <laughs> you know so that way you're not fighting invasives in the future before you get out in the field and actually start doing work managing non-native invasive species consult with a professional have a certified forester come out to your property a private lands biologist somebody who can First and foremost, really help you identify the problematic non-native invasives on your property because it's actually pretty interesting. They vary from property to property. You could be on a certain piece of property and it's chock full of autumn olive. You go a mile down the road and there's no autumn olive, but it's all Japanese stiltgrass and ailanthus. And more than anything, identifying the correct species and knowing how to treat them before you even get started is, is step number one because Alanthus trees are tree of heaven. If you don't know any better, they're very much a look-alike to poplar trees, especially when they're younger. The bark, texture, color, everything is very, very similar. Japanese barberry and multifloral, multifloral rose looks extremely similar to blackberry. We want a lot of blackberry. It's very beneficial to all wildlife and humans who like to eat blackberries, <laughs> myself included. We don't want Japanese barberry, we don't want multifloral rose. So knowing the difference between those species, having somebody out, certified forester, somebody who knows what they're doing, a professional in this line of work who can help you identify what we want, beneficial species, what we want to encourage, and what we want to get rid of, and to identify the differences between each should be step number one before you fire up the sprayer or get to work because if you're not careful you can do more harm than good. There are actually several different techniques that you can use to control the non-native invasives on your property and a lot of it depends on the species, the size of the plant, time of year, and, and when and how you can go about employing each technique. And on this Alanthus tree, this is actually a pretty decent sized one. You can see we double girdled it, just took the chainsaw, you're only cutting an inch into the cambium doesn't take much just barely cutting two rings around the tree and we're treating it 
with herbicide after the fact. So this is a this is a good method that I like to use on bigger trees because if you're hacking and squirting, which is another technique, I mean this you're hacking and hacking and hacking and squirting and squirting and squirting with just a chainsaw and a squirt bottle, you can knock out a handful of these trees. My dad and I did, oh gosh, 150 to 200 in a couple hours last year of these Alanthus trees. I would run the chainsaw, he would follow behind with the squirt bottle. Even if you're doing it by yourself, just make a couple rings around the tree, squirt your herbicide in the wound and that tree is dead and just doesn't know it yet. And this is a good example right here Again, another reason to contact a certified forester, your private lands biologist, and get them out there so they can walk you through the different species because this is an Alanthus tree. And right behind it is a poplar tree. And if you're unfamiliar with your tree species, I mean, that tree's been dead for, for over a year, so it's starting to darken and, and look dead. But when it was alive and strong, it's almost an idea identical twin to a poplar tree. I mean, same texture, same smooth bark, same coloration. And an important thing to keep in mind, specific to Tree of Heaven, and it's just another reason to talk with a certified forester or a private lands biologist and have him or her school you on the species and how they respond to different kinds of treatment. Like this Tree of Heaven, if I were just to come in here and just cut it clean off and think that that killed it, I did nothing but to upset it and piss it off and make it angry. If I were to just cut this tree clean off and just leave it there, it would stump sprout very angrily. There would be literally probably a hundred little saplings, little shoots coming off the root system. Alanthus, to give them some credit, they are very aggressive and they don't like being messed with. That's why they can take over a stand so quickly. But it's something to keep in mind. Like I said, if, when managing non-native invasives, if you're not careful, you can't actually do more harm than good. And we really, we can't stress this enough is to speak with a certified forest or a professional and have him or her walk you through the steps in the process. But like I said, on this tree, we double girdled, treated with herbicide. It is dead, thankfully. It makes me feel really good, but you can also hack and squirt on smaller trees like this poplar right here. I mean, this is, this is a smaller tree. I really want, it would be more, trouble to carry a chainsaw to girdle two rings around this tree put it down pick up the herbicide bottle and squirt 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 around it twice on a tree of this size it's easier to just carry a hatchet or a machete you want to make a cut for every three inches of diameter you're making a hack just a little bit of herbicide in the wound a hack for every three inches of diameter like i said and that tree would be dead another tree of this size this is about as big as that i would want a basil spray but a basil spray is just basically mixing, again, certified forester, depending on the species, they will educate you on what type of herbicide to use and when. But a basil spray is basically, you want to mix it with a crop oil or a penetrating oil. Diesel fuel is probably the cheapest and it's what I use the most often, but you're just spraying a ring 360 degrees around the trunk of the tree, probably 18 to 24 inches up high and you're really just painting the base of the tree with the herbicide and the fuel. And on, again, on trees of this size or smaller, that's a really effective way to, to kill those trees standing and basically kill them without letting them know that they're going to die, which is always a satisfying work, is doing the work and then coming back after the fact and seeing them dead. There's no better feeling. So after you did all that hard work, you put all the time and effort into doing your homework, knowing what herbicide to use, you know, uh, the timing of when you sh uh, should do this and when you should not do it. What do you gain from all this? You know, um, you gain so much. The benefits are just out of this world. And just like this site right here, there was a lot of tree of heaven. There was barberry, there was other invasives, and there's still plenty of work to do to keep the management of the invasives out of this site. But when you release those native plants they're no longer fighting for sun they're no longer fighting for energy the nutrients in the soil and this is just like a site that's a couple years old cody went in here and just attacked it and just from him doing that we have if you look around here we have greenbrier we have um, regular just blackberry we have forbs we have grasses all this stuff, if he would have not gotten in here 
and attacked it like you're, you're supposed to. This would be a solid stand of invasives and all this right here would be competing against it, against it and trust me, it would lose because not, uh, invasives, they're just really competitive and uh, just do little things. It's amazing the benefit that you get from it, especially the wildlife that will use this site. Just that alone is a win. So we started this episode off with a question and it was kind of to get you to stop and think and we kind of arrived at a different answer that the question was intended to accomplish and that is that managing non-native invasive species on your property is arguably the most important thing you can do for the habitat and the wildlife they call it home and we kind of walked you through the process in general of what managing non-native invasives looks like from the very beginning bringing out a forester or a certified forester or a professional to walk you through the process of identifying what species are problematic and how to treat those species. We talked about the different methodology and how, when and where and how to do them from girdling to hack and squirt, basil spray. And of course we talked about the, the tangible physical benefits that, that you can see and observe in releasing natives and how wildlife respond to native plant species, which is the ultimate end goal and the name of the game, really. But more than anything else, removing non-native invasive species off of your property, it, it starts with a decision. And that decision is to take what you have and leave it better than you found it, which is the essence of wildlife management, of conservation, of land stewardship. And it's a lot of work. It can be overwhelming. And the main thing to keep reminding yourself is to not let it be intimidating because it is a never ending process. No matter how hard you hit it one year, they're gonna come back the next year. The, the impressive thing about non-native invasives is the amount of seed that they put out. So whether we like it or not, they're in the seed bank and they're going to be there for a long time so we can clean an area out and they're gonna keep coming back, but we gotta stay on top of them. But again, it's just a decision to realize that it's a fight worth fighting and to not let yourself be overwhelmed because it is so much work. When you look at your property, don't try to do the entire piece of property in one year because you're gonna get burned out, you're gonna feel defeated. Break it up into quadrants. Manage an acre or two at a time in this block. Manage an acre or two at a time over here. Identify a certain species and say, you know, this year I'm really gonna hit autumn olive heart and then next year I'm really going to get after the stilt grass and then manage your expectations and your goals and what you can accomplish realistically as you're managing non-native invasives because it is a lot of work we've mentioned it it's not for the faint of heart but for the habitat and the wildlife that call it home it is absolutely necessary and a critical part of your wildlife management journey but at the end of the day as much work as it is for me it's satisfying work it's it's sweat equity but it is work that i enjoy but at the end of the day, you got to remind yourself to have fun, enjoy it, smile where you're, while you're out there, be grateful for the opportunity to get out, stretch your legs, manage habitat, and enjoy wildlife. And just as it is for you, it is for me, wildlife is our way of life. And actually doing the work, you should probably contact a professional, whether that be a forest or your private land. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like,